Good morning and welcome to the worship of God at Fairview United Church of Christ on this Memorial Day Sunday. Thank you for joining us today. Today I have a special prayer that I would like to share with you. This is a Memorial Day prayer written by Chaplain Bob Sines, who is the chaplain of Homer White Legion Post 66 in Hiawatha. So let us pray and then we'll ask God to be with us in this worship service. Almighty God, we are gathering in spirit today to honor fallen deceased, all who paid with their lives in wars and dangerous services, placing themselves in jeopardy on behalf of freedom. Lord, we ask you to bless the families who will be in remembrance on Memorial Day. Lord, we ask that you keep us all safe from the dreadful virus that is disrupting and taking the lives of so many. Lord, we beseech you to help us maintain the freedom and love for each other by joining us together to save lives and the future for our children. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And Holy Spirit, come dwell among us. We pray that our worship, our music, and our words would be acceptable in the sight of God, Almighty Father. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening song today is the, it's the song by Thomas Dorsey, which he wrote at a time in his life where he was in extreme grief. Uh, family members had died, and he was hanging on to faith with his, with his hands. He was just hanging on as tight as he could. And some of the fruits of his struggle are this song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. morning I have just a little nail in my hand. It's about a two and a half inch long nail and I just got to thinking about if you've ever gone into an old house or maybe a house somebody's just moved out of and you see nails in the wall, you probably have, and did you ever wonder what used to be on those nails? Was it pictures of family? 
Was it a picture of a beautiful landscape? Was it maybe a cross or maybe a picture of Jesus? Well, I want to tell you a true story about somebody that you might know, Phil Figs. Uh, Phil had a friend who was going through a really tough time. He was going through a divorce. And this friend told Phil, he said, I go home and I don't mind the missing furniture, but what I don't like is looking at those walls and seeing those empty nails. Because every one of those empty nails contained a memory that he and his wife had built together. Children, family members, special vacations, and now there were just empty nails on the wall. Well, Phil went home, and if you know Phil, you know he has got an attic that is just full of pictures. And so he went up there in the attic and he got a whole carload of pictures. And while his friend was at work, he got into the house and hung a picture on every one of those nails. Some of them were pictures of Jesus. Some of them were pictures of Scripture. So when that friend came home from work, instead of seeing empty nails, he saw the face of Jesus. Now that's how God remembers us. This is Memorial Day weekend. And think about those empty nails, what they might represent for us. Those empty nails that cause us to feel sad. Maybe it's a, an empty nail of fear, or it's an empty nail of regret, or it's an empty nail of tragedy. Well, God tells us that He has written our names on the palms of His hands. And you know what He used? Empty nails those same empty nails of sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. God has used those empty nails to write our names on the palm of His hands. So we need to never worry that we are being forgotten. We are not forgotten. God takes care of all of us. Jesus said, think about the lilies. Consider the lilies of the field. God takes care of them, and how much more will God take care of you? So if God is taking care of the lilies of the field, we know that God remembers all of our needs, including our need to be remembered. We are never forgotten. God has written your name on the palm of His hands. Amen. I've chosen a couple of readings this morning. The first is from Exodus chapter 20, verses... 1 through 17, and you may know these verses as the Ten Commandments. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below and you shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. Now this is, once again, the story of Jesus calming the storm. And I know we had this a few weeks ago, but it just, this just seemed to fit with what I believe God wants us to hear this week. So... Again, this is Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. Um, this is, I think we read Mark's account of Jesus calming the storm. This is Matthew's gospel of Jesus calming the storm. Jesus got into the boat and His disciples followed Him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke Him, saying, Lord, save us! We are going to drown. Jesus replied, O oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, 
What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase. Send your Spirit to guide our words, guide our meditations, open our hearts, help us to speak only what is true. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those first of the three Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verses 3, 4, and 7. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, and you shall not take the name of your Lord in vain. So right off we have prohibition against idolatry, making an idol, and blasphemy, taking the name of the Lord in vain. Now, did you ever wonder about those first three commandments? Doesn't it seem like uh, God is just wanting to show us who's boss? But if that's so, it would mean God is pretty thin-skinned and needs an awful lot of flattery because if we don't give Him all the attention and always say nice things about Him, it seems like He's going to retaliate with punishments. He's going to withhold His love until we come groveling back. But you know what? That is how generations of people have interpreted God's first three commandments. We've got to keep God happy or He's going to torture us and kill us. And He's going to stop loving us. But you know what? That's not a loving relationship. That is what we call an abusive relationship. It's a sick relationship. And that's the relationship a lot of people have with other human beings and with God. And this is not speaking the truth about God. God is unchanging. If God's love depends upon us saying nice things about Him and doing certain things, then God would not be God. That is not agape love. Agape love is eternal and unchanging, and it doesn't depend on anything we do. All we have to do is accept that love. Now, if our relationship with God changes, it's not because God has moved. Guess who has moved? God sent Jesus to seek and save the lost. And the lost are the ones who moved. Those are the ones that Jesus came to seek and save. And Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. So God's love for us is eternal. It doesn't depend upon anything we've done or anything we can do. We are saved by grace through faith. God's not going to force anything on us we, want, we don't want, though. He's not going to make us accept His love. But if we want to be saved, then God's love is right there, waiting for us to give God permission to enter our hearts and to make us a new creation from the inside out. So then, what is the point of these first three commandments? Well, God is warning us against idolatry, making an idol. And idolatry is, very simply, whenever we make something God that is not God. That's what an idol is. Idolatry is whenever we make the means into an end. The end of our faith is God. God is the end of our faith. When we make the means to the end the object of our attention and our worship, then we have made the means into an idol. It doesn't mean we have to melt our jewelry down into a golden calf in order to make something God that isn't God. And the Israelites made a golden calf to worship. It wasn't because they were trying to replace God. They honestly thought God was going to be pleased by this. What they were doing is they were trying to preserve one moment. They were trying to preserve one memory of something that God did. God led them out of Egypt. They wanted to memorialize that blessing by freezing it in time and, and freezing it and, and cementing it into a gold object. The same way Jesus' disciples, remember, wanted to build a temple. They wanted to build three dwelling places for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the top of Mount Tabor when He was transfigured. Their intention was to please God. 
by trying to contain one moment of God's blessing. But by trying to contain one moment of God's blessing, they were unwittingly creating an idol. They were making their memory of the experience of God's blessing more important than their ongoing moment-by-moment relationship with God. It's a really subtle trap that we can build for ourselves. The golden calf was the Israelites' attempt to preserve and protect a sacred memory. Instead of moving forward with God, day by day, and trusting God to be with them as they lived in the present moment. They were trying to protect what for them had been an experience of God's holiness and love. You see how subtle that is. Now, 4,000 years later, I don't think anybody is going to bow down and worship a golden calf. Well, maybe some people might. But people still fall into idolatry whenever we make something into God that is not God. Whenever we want to hold one moment in our memory or one particular way of worship or life as having greater value than the ongoing daily walk of faith with Jesus Christ, whenever we say, this thing is too big for God to handle, every time we try to contain God's love in one moment or one building or one way, and preserve the memory of a sacred moment to the exclusion of God's Lordship over all. Those are the moments that we have created an idol. And you know, you don't even have to love something or even want it in order to make it into an idol and worship it. We just worship something. We worship whatever we give more attention to than God. That's what makes it an idol. In that Gospel reading now, that's why I chose that Gospel, why I believe God chose that Gospel reading for us today. The disciples are in the boat with the Lord Jesus, and a storm comes up. And they are terrified. They're terrified of the storm. But they have the Lord Jesus in the boat with them. But what are they giving their attention to? The storm. They're giving that storm more importance than they are Jesus Christ. They don't like the storm. They don't want the storm, but are they worshiping Jesus? No, they are worshiping the storm because they are giving that storm more importance in their life and more power than they are Jesus Christ, who is right there in the boat with them. They have more faith in the power of the storm than they have in the power of God to save them. And so they have made an idol out of their fear and out of the storm. Even after Jesus calms the storm, what do they say? Do they say, praise God? No, they say, who is this? He, he, even the storm obeyed Him. So they, they're, still, they're still in love with that storm, the idea that the storm is very powerful. They can't let that go and just fall into the arms of God. They forgot about Jesus because they were busy worshiping the storm. And they were worshiping the storm by giving it more credit than the power of Jesus Christ to save them. So the storm had become an idol. Their hearts were not full of God. Their minds were not full of God. They were full of fear and awe about this storm. They thought, this storm is too big for God. Do we ever do this? This disease is too big for God. This mess is too big for God. My sin is too great. It's too big for God to forgive. My pain is too great for God to heal. I will never forgive that person for what they did to me. My revenge on that person is more important than the freedom that God promises me through forgiveness. These are all examples of idolatrous thinking. And that's a double tragedy. When we make an idol out of something that we don't even want, that we don't even like, yet when we give those things more attention and more time than we do spending in God's presence and being still and hearing God's voice, those things become idols too, even if we don't want them. If we give them attention, more attention than we give to God, those are idols when we are blinded to God's love by our fear, our fear becomes an idol. Fulton Sheen said about idolatry, 
if you do not worship God, you worship something, and nine times out of ten, what you worship is going to be yourself. We have a duty to worship God, not because God will be imperfect and unhappy if we do not, but because we will be imperfect and unhappy if we do not. Idolatry ultimately hurts us. It doesn't hurt God. It hurts God in that we are turning away from Him, but it doesn't diminish God if we worship an idol. We cannot make God less perfect by worshiping an idol, but we can certainly make ourselves imperfect. We can certainly make ourselves sinful. Our relationship with God through Jesus Christ is about being transformed by the renewal of our minds, as the Apostle Paul writes. Not one time, but every day, day by day, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds through Jesus Christ. If change and growth are not a central part of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if we are not constantly on guard against being blinded by fear and fanaticism, then our religion in the end will end up worshiping the status quo. We're going to worship our, our, our our imaginary false sense of security. We're going to end up worshiping the past and protecting our own ego. That's what idolatry is. We protect our ego and we worship something that is not God, but we treat it as though it were God. If we feel we have to protect God from someone or some group of people or from something in creation, then that thing is not God. Because God does not need our protection. That's our ego we're protecting. Nothing is bigger than God. No storm is bigger than God. No disease is bigger than God. No fear is bigger than God. No power on earth is bigger than God. No war is bigger than God. No political movement, no word of gossip, no economic downturn is bigger than God. No act of hatred or terror is bigger than God. No drought is bigger than God. No flood is bigger than God. No family strife is bigger than God. No disaster, no tragedy, no matter how profound it is for us, it is not bigger than God. Jesus came to show us that we had made idols out of the very things that we didn't want because we had allowed those things to become our identity. And so God sent Jesus Christ to give us a new identity. Children of God. This was good news for the, for the outcasts in Jesus' day. It wasn't so much good news for the Pharisees wasn't so much good news for the Roman authorities because as people, we usually don't appreciate it when somebody comes up to us and tells us, you know what, you've been worshiping an idol. You know, you're not worshiping God. You don't know who God is. You've just been worshiping an idol your whole life. The religious leaders in Jesus' day were not happy when Jesus pointed this out. And the religious leaders didn't thank Jesus when He explained to the Pharisees that they were more in love with their rituals and quoting Scripture, than they were loving God and loving their neighbor. They did not thank Jesus when He told them that they loved their power more than they loved God, more than they loved their neighbors. They didn't humbly ask Jesus to forgive them when He, told, he showed them that their love of God was being eclipsed by their love of temple taxes and blood sacrifices and rituals that they thought could contain God's love. They weren't happy when Jesus told them that God's love for the whole world was so great that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that to worship God doesn't mean you have to be in a temple. It doesn't mean you have to be on a mountain. But it means you worship God in the Holy Spirit and in truth. And those good religious people, those Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did not appreciate it when they recognized themselves in Jesus' parables. And when they saw that, they didn't allow the Holy Scripture to change them. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't see that they had been using the Holy Scripture as a tool to 
clobber other people, the good religious people of Jesus' day were using the Word of God as a tool of power for themselves. And this is the height of idolatry. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were not worshiping God, they were worshiping their own egos. But when they found out this, they didn't thank Jesus for opening their eyes. Now, taking the name of the Lord in vain. I just want to talk about that a little bit. This is not just about using profanity. Profanity is its rude, yes. It is offensive, yes. But profanity and taking the name of the Lord in vain are not necessarily the same things. In ancient Israel, the name was very important. It was felt that the name contained the essence of the person being named. We see this throughout the Old Testament. When someone's given a name, they live up to that name. And so if you invoke a person's name in Jesus' day and in ancient Israel, it was felt that it was like having that person there with you. Even though that person may not physically be there with you, when you invoke their name, it is as if that person were there. Even more so when you invoked the name of God. Because when we invoke God's name we become aware of God's eternal and abiding presence among us. So in short, what this means is, you don't call God's name unless you want God. And that's what it means. Now in Hebrew, God's name is spelled with four Hebrew letters. yod Hey, vav Hey, or Y-H-W-H. And these are four consonants. There's no vowels in there. So whenever a Jewish person, even today, if a Jewish person is reciting Scripture from the Old Testament, and they encounter this word in Hebrew, this yod heh vav heh they will substitute another word, Adonai, which means Lord. And so if you look in your Bible, in your English translations, and you see the word Lord written in all capital letters, those are the times where in the Hebrew it is written yod heh vav heh God's special name. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture over the centuries on how to properly pronounce God's name because, as we said, there are no, there are no vowels in the Hebrew. It's just four consonants, yod, he, vav, he. So some people say you pronounce it Yahweh. Other people say, no, it's Jehovah. But there's a growing number of Bible scholars who believe that the name yod heh vav heh God's special name, is actually the sound of our breathing. That that is meant to represent the sound of our breath. And if that is so, that means every time we breathe, we are proclaiming the name of God. Because God is the one who gave us that gift of life, who gave us that breath, who breathed that breath into our nostrils. So the first sound that a newborn baby makes is to say the name of God. The, the people there in the delivery room, they listen for it. And so the name of God is expressed in the form of that newborn baby's cry. And everybody rejoices with that first sign that that baby is alive, that baby can breathe, that baby has the breath of life. The last sound a person makes before they leave this world, a dying person, the last word on their lips is the name of God in that last breath they make. Automatically, many times a day, we proclaim the name of God when we breathe in and out. We are giving constant expression to the name of our Creator who gave us that breath. And so there's never really any doubt about whose we are because every day we are proclaiming the name of God hundreds of times. Our existence, then, is a gift from the One who is the source of all. Who gave us that breath at our, when we were born. Who gave us that breath. And so, to take the name of the Lord in vain is to waste that gift of breath on anything that does not point us to God. Of anything that does not speak of heavenly things, of eternal things. It is any time we use our God-given breath to speak words that do not build up, that do not point to heaven, that do not point to God. That is blasphemy. 
to waste the gift of life that God has given us on anything that does not lead us to God. And that is the other side of the coin of idolatry. On the other side, blasphemy. On the other side, idolatry. Again, idolatry is making something into God that is not God. So, our prayer today and every day is that our world will turn to God. Not images of God. Not somebody's idea of God. But that we will worship God. True God in spirit and in truth. And always we will use that gift of life that God has given to us in ways that point us and point others to God and to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Would you now join with me in prayer? And as we pray, as always, please join your own private prayer intentions to this prayer. And we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, we come to You now with all of our prayers and petitions. We pray that Your Holy Spirit will intercede for us this morning, that You will make up for what is lacking in our words. First of all, we pray for the families of those who have died. We pray especially for the families of Marilyn Luthold and Dennis Garrett and John Dawson and for all those who have left this world this week. We pray for their families who grieve, And as we prepare for Memorial Day, we also remember the families of those soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice for their families, for their country, for the sake of freedom and justice. Lord, we also pray for healing and strengthening for all those who need to feel that healing power of Jesus Christ today. We pray for Joanne. We pray for Marilyn and Carl. We pray for Mel and Cheryl, for Loretta, for Earl, for Brandy and Ike. We pray for Terry and Lucy, all those people who need to feel your healing. Holy Spirit, give them joy, health, hope, and peace. We also pray, Lord, that you would bless and strengthen all marriages. Bless our families, bless our community relationships. Help us to be good at communicating, Lord. Give us your Holy Spirit to speak for us. Help us to be good listeners and communicators. We lift up those who have troubled marriages. We lift up those who have broken family relationships. We pray for those also who are awaiting the results of medical tests. We pray for favorable outcomes for those tests. Lord, we lift up our nation. We pray that You would bless the citizens of this country. We ask that You bless the elected representatives. Give them wisdom and give them courage. Bless all those people who doubt and give them hope and assurance of your life and love. Bless all of those who are fearful of the future and help us us all to be bold in the way that Jesus Christ needs us to be bold. We also pray for the frontline workers in hospitals and facilities that are full of sick people. We pray for those who are worried about contracting the virus. We pray that you will protect them as they tend to the sick and injured. We pray especially for those who have someone ill under the same roof. Again, we pray for the men and women of the armed forces and their families. We pray for those who are in active duty and for the veterans and for their families. We lift up those who don't have enough money to make ends meet, for those who have lost jobs. We pray that you open doors of opportunity for them. We pray for parents who are expecting Fill them with health. Bless their unborn babies. Give them an unshakable sense of Your presence. And Lord, these prayers and the ones that we hold in the silence of our hearts, we raise to You now in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As a closing song, I'd like to offer America the Beautiful, and we'll close with a special prayer 
for this is a, another prayer by Chaplain Bob Sines that he calls the people's prayer. So first, America the beautiful. Let us pray. O oh God, bless our land with honorable industry, medical research, and sound learning to protect all the earth. Bless our veterans, doctors, and first responders. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion to defend our liberties. Instill us with the spirit of wisdom of those to whom we entrust the authority of government that there may be peace and true justice at home. May there be obedience to your law among the nations of the earth. In times of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness. And in days of trouble, let not our trust in you fail. Bless those veterans who did bear arms for our country and those that do today. And bless the Legion members who have never forgotten our brothers and sisters who lost their lives. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you again next Sunday. God bless.